Okay, so uh, Peter Brötzmann, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I think you have shaped many generations uh, of musicians. And to kick things off, I wanted to ask you, um, maybe you can take us back. Your first album was released in the 60s, end of 60s. And maybe you can take us back what the your state of mind was, what the general situation in post-war Germany was and yeah where were you and what was your yeah uh, impression of that time now yeah I mean that's uh, more than 50 years ago and it was in the middle of 60s and uh, it was quite heavy times I mean uh, Vietnam was coming up uh, Uh, all the movements, the students' movements in not only Germany, in France, Britain, everywhere uh, it was happening. And uh, uh, the good thing was I had already my contacts to my Dutch comrades and the English guys. And uh, we all wanted the same. We wanted to change things. And uh, not only the music. We, naive and uh, foolish as we was at that time, uh, we wanted to change the world. Which, uh, now yeah, I must say, we haven't been very successful. <laughs> But uh, music-wise, of course, we made some progress and uh, it was uh, compared to nowadays what the young guys uh, nowadays uh, experience it was a complete different time yeah it, it was a kind of it was a time of solidarity it was a kind of collaboration And it was a time of having more or less the same spirit. And it was already the time, the first connection to the American musicians, which had, of course, a uh, different uh, political uh, situation. But, uh, I mean the killings of Martin Luther King was happening and all that. I mean, uh, there was a big coalition of now we have to change things. Yeah, yeah, that's... And uh, of course it looked different in Germany, it looked different in Holland, but at the end uh, it was the same spirit. And out of that same spirit, I was maybe the first one who who opened up his first uh, uh, private uh, record company. Mm -hmm. But it follow it was followed by uh, the ICP in Holland. It was followed by Incas in in Great Britain. So. Everywhere was happening the same, the same, and uh, yeah. Uh, if I if I talk to young people nowadays, they can't imagine this kind of spirit anymore. Yeah, yeah, course. that's the thing because I mean I'm 26 years old, and today, like musicians, like like me, we have all those references. We have uh, reference recordings, ideas. We have uh, even like something like free jazz theory although, uh, although this categorization <laughs> yeah, is, is yeah, horrible yeah. and uh, yeah, it, yeah i mean uh, if i may interrupt uh, you uh, i mean even to get information at that time information what was happening in the states for example with the music it was not easy you had to have somebody who was traveling You had to had somebody who was sending some printed uh, matters, or uh, it was not so so easy. Yeah. And especially here in Germany, 
because of the break of of the Nazi regime, we had uh, no connections anymore. I mean, if I went to Holland at that time, there was still a kind of jazz scene, but here was yeah, more or less nothing. Yeah. So it was very difficult to get the information together. And nowadays, of course, you open up your your book and everything you have there. And uh, that I think we had a better end. Yeah, I, yeah. I think nowadays things are too easy. In a way, yes, because I always think to I always try to um, to get back into the sixties and then think to myself, okay, so the music you made back then, I mean, to come up with this or to have this kind of sound or this idea of sound. Today, of course, more or less everything is possible. But at that point of time, um, did you have like a moment or like any or what was the process in developing your sound? Did you have like a moment where you thought like... No, no, I had no idea. Okay. I, I When I still was at school in my hometown in Remscheid, I was playing in this uh, swing Swing Dixieland band, and, and they asked me to buy a tenor saxophone. <laughs> and I had no idea. I had no teacher. Nobody could show me something. And uh, so what I uh, had was only my, my own experience. And that's why, I mean, I'm still not a good saxophone player in the sense of all these young kids coming out of the school. Yeah. But uh, I was uh, able to, to build my own sound. And the, our information in the 60s, let's say, uh, uh, you had a, a very lively concert scene. I've heard all the Coltrane bands. I have heard all my Davis stuff wow. with... With Dolphy, with uh, Adderley, Horace Silver, Art Blake, it was all over the place. But Paul even I heard with Coleman Hawkins. And that was our, we had to travel for that, but mm. that was our information more or less. Wow. And of course, that was a very direct information to sit in a place and to see Bud Powell playing. That is the difference, and you got it. You got the information out of the, uh, I don't know what, YouTube or yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah. That was a good, that was really a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I can I can imagine, yeah. I mean... Uh... And you went, after the concert, you went into the bar around the corner, and you could, if you was lucky, you could sit next table to... Or a silver, or what? <laughs> wow, or yeah. friends, friends in Solingen, yeah. here, not very far from my town. Yeah, uh, they were running a jazz club, and they even host, uh, organized a, a Telonius Monk quartet concert in their town hall there, and things like that. I mean, uh, that was that really was different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. And what was the uh, what were the first reactions of like um, I don't know, like the uh, normal musicians or so-called uh, establishment? Did they did they uh, yeah. perceive uh, you, uh, yeah. or, or were, were you completely ignored? How was it? I'm, no, not ignored. But uh, I mean, with this trio, I played at the. the Frankfurt Jazz Festival in 66 or so, of 65. Mm -hmm. And of course, the reaction was, uh, oh, that's no music, that's no jazz, that's no nothing. And a little number of people said, okay, that's something, something else, something uh, worth to listen to. And especially, I must say, my older American friends like Steve Lacey or Lee Connitz or 
They came because they saw, man, the reaction was bad for me. <laughs> and as a young man, you you need sometimes ah, a little kick in the ass. And the Connets after the concert came to me, said, hey, Bratzmann, make your thing, go ahead. <laughs> and uh, this was very, very, very important. Wow. And uh, I mean, I, I just wanted to do my thing. And I did it, and my uh, the good thing was that people like Steve Lacey, Carla Blay, Don Sherry a little later, they were really uh, a big help. In. They invited me to play, and uh, when I when my let's say the German comrades out of that time realized that. Say my reputation grew uh, a little bit. So then the work with with Schlippenbach and Schof started, and uh, we organized concerts together, and so on. So it was a slow process, but uh, it was working. Okay, yeah. And um, yeah, you mentioned uh, yeah a lot of the. US names and uh, there's always like this discrepancy between like the Americans and the Europeans and some critiques even say that the European free jazz scene like completely um, developed uh, their own thing without uh, the roots uh, or having their roots in American culture so uh, uh, no. I, I think I, I remember that time that was in 60s early 70s, especially a group of English musicians said, we don't want to have anything to do with these Americans. But uh, that was nonsense. Yeah. I mean, without the music of Louis Armstrong or Duke Ellington, we wouldn't have started what we started in the 60s. But on the other hand, uh, that was a new situation that the Europeans try to find out their own thing, yeah. where their own roots were. Yeah. And our roots are in European culture, and uh, we don't have the blues, we are not black people. We had to live with what we have, and uh, I think we realized that, and uh, let's say some names, uh, European names like Derek Bailey yeah. or Michel Mengelberg, uh, they were aware of that. And uh, uh, for sure we developed our own European thing. And in between people like uh, Braxton, for example, or George Lewis or a bunch of others, Uh, I'm sure they learned quite a bit of the way we are doing our things. Yeah, yeah, and I mean that's a, that's a nice thing, of course. I mean, not to have the static uh, type of music and everything. And uh, but I would be all also interested as when uh, did like the connection to Japan came because I mean the Japanese improvised uh, music scene i mean that that's very special that's completely or not completely different but very different to yeah, other but, yeah i mean uh, we had uh, started koval boca 10 and i we had that it's a merse festival yeah and uh, <laughs> which is quite exactly 50 years ago or so and uh, uh Uh, after the first, second, third version of it, which seemed uh, to be quite successful, we got some international reputation. And Japanese people, uh, there were two of them, two journalists. One was called Aida, A-I-D-A, and the other one was Sujima. S-O-Y-O-M-A. Uh, these two guys came and organized 
Japanese musicians to to join us. And even there was not much money around, but they made it with the help of uh, Japan support system. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, the Yamasa trio with Akira and uh, Moriyama, the drummer, which I still work with from time to time. And so the connection started, and then one of the guys, Ida, invited Europeans to Japan. Yeah. And I think the first was Derek Bailey, and then Han Benning and I followed. And that was already in 1980. Yeah. That was my first visit in Japan. But since then, I go nearly every year there. And the Japanese uh, collaboration is a very, very important yeah. part of my my work. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I mean, do you feel that there are some, I don't know, like historical connection? Because, I mean, if, I mean, of course, the Japanese and European history isn't the same, but... I mean, especially uh, like from the 30s to 40s, 50s, there are some similarities. Do you see it resembled in music in some ways or even uh, amplified in, in Japanese free music? Uh, I didn't cut that acoustically now at the moment. Oh, um, could, could you repeat that? Yeah, please? yeah. Um, so, uh, like, although the history, of course, of Japan and, and Europe isn't exactly the same, I mean, especially the era between the 30s and the 40s, 50s, they are kind of similar. And do you think that uh, that's, or, or, or do you have the feeling, and if you have the feeling, what elements of Japanese uh, free music are amplified or, or similar to uh, to the European one, or is this just, uh, or are they just doing their own thing? Mm, of course, they were, after the war, uh, very much connected to the Americans first. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I, I think we can't, generalize things. Yeah. I mean, at the end, I'm the only German who is going there regular and who has a big audience there and who has, uh, over the decades, the connections. And uh, the Americans started uh, in the late or mid of 70s Uh, Milford Graves, for example, was the first one who who got in touch with the, uh, let's call it avant-garde musicians. Yeah. But what I had to learn is that the Japanese way of thinking is a different one. Mm -hmm. And even they, they always looked Uh, to what is happening in the States, but they started to look what's happening in Europe, and especially, I think, Han Benning or Mengelberg or Derek Bailey, maybe myself, I hope. We had, uh, we had quite some influence on them, but mm. they do it their own way. Yeah. Yeah. They have their own way of... Uh, language and uh, uh, they are different and even if I go there so often I still don't understand it yeah. but I like to work with them yeah 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 and uh, it's a it's a kind of very personal thing it took me long years to build up the friendship to uh, K.J. Aino, for example. Okay. I worked with him the first time in, in the early 80s, and I just can say now, during the last 10 years, we got very, very, very close together. But uh, 
different from my connections with my um, mostly black American friends, there is still a distance yeah. to to the Japanese guys. Yeah. It's so, and and that's fine for me. If the music works, everything is fine. Okay. Yeah, and uh, so then also over the years, uh, I think you could say that, um, yeah, your music or let's call it avant-garde or free got integrated more and more into like, uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, high culture, if you want to take that name by means of, uh, I don't know, broadcasting uh, your music on, on, on public, uh, on the public radio stations and everything. And um, did you did you care about that that it or did you like it that your music got more and more into? Um... No, no, it's not a good thing. You're losing control over your work. Okay. That's that's the main problem of the nowadays situation. I must say the the collaboration in the early years, 60s, 70s, until the 80s with a German radio station, even if he complained all the time, but that was a really good one to work mm -hmm. with uh, Michael Naura at the Norddeutsche Rundfunk or work mm -hmm. with uh, Manfred Miller, Siegfried schmidt at Radio Bremen. We had uh, the very, very big influence of Joachim Hans Berendt and the Süddeutsche Rundfunk and the Berlin Jazz Festival, and so on. This was quite, if I look back, a very, very good situation. Yeah. Uh, but this is gone, because the, the radio station, uh, stations changed their way of mm, programming, administration, and everything. Yeah. So there's not much left. Uh, and nowadays you have everything on the net yeah. and you can't control nothing anymore. The recording situation for even an amateur is so easy to yeah. produce. Uh, I remember the first concert when all this little uh, equipment came uh, on the market and everybody was sitting in the concert, you still could say, hey guys, put that machine away, <laughs> because you saw it. Yeah. Nowadays you don't see the stuff anymore, and they are not one or two, there are hundreds of people yeah. with the iPhone or whatever, and the quality is there. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, It's it's a very 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 bad uh, situation for for us because we work and we don't get paid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that is the big problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, definitely. I mean, I remember that I don't know two or three years ago a a bootleg from New York was released officially, uh, but I think that's. Uh, more the exception than <laughs> than the normal yeah was yeah i mean you you find you find very curious things in in this i mean if i go to china or if i go to russia you see so many productions you never will see again you never have an idea and the quality mostly is bad and uh, it's so cheap shit And uh, that doesn't do the music good, yeah. I must say. Yeah. And uh, of course, the main thing is, if you work, you should get paid. And yeah. if your work is spread over the whole fucking world, and you don't get a penny for that, that's not the right idea. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, and it's very, very difficult to find a system to change that. I don't see it. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't care so much because uh, I, I don't look through all that, what is possible nowadays. 
but my old comrade Joe Gavers, who is running, was running free music production. Yeah. He uh, is publishing my work, and he always looks around and he finds things. Then he has to put them out, yeah. and uh, then even some people take them off. But in the next second, it's there somewhere else. Yeah. So you can't, you don't have any kind of control. Yeah. And that's a very bad situation. It is, it is. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, when we were talking about public uh, radio stations on and uh, NDR and VDR, Uh, I wanted to ask you about an incident uh, that a jazz friend of mine said uh, he had seen on television or he uh, saw the recording of it and it was with uh, in a in a talk show or something with Klaus Doldinger in the oh, 70s yeah. and 80s yeah, yeah. and can you can you maybe yeah, recap what what happened there or what was the, the Yeah I show? mean it's long ago and I haven't I haven't seen it since then, but of course I'm asked quite quite often. That was a Radio Bremen production, mm -hmm. and the guy who was organizing it was Siegfried schmidt mm -hmm. and uh, I was quite a frequent guest at Radio Bremen at that time, because I was playing in Bremen in the clubs, a famous Lila Euler very often, mm -hmm. and the radio passed by. And, uh, yeah, I, and Schmidt was, was, was a very, uh, very interesting guy. He, he tried to make things clear, and, and so we had this, uh, discussion of what it was. Uh, between the Doldinger Quartet, that was uh, Klaus Doldinger and Peter Trunk on the bass, and uh, Siegfried uh, Hoffmann on the organ, and I think it was Peter Weiss on drums. I'm not so sure any. And I was there with uh, Peter Kowald, of course, and Aldo Romano the Italian-French drama. Mm -hmm. And, uh, now, yeah, uh, we played a bit, and then discussion started, and and uh, I can't remember. I just remember that Peter Trunk, who was the most progressive guy out of that quartet, He blamed me, oh, you can't do play, you don't play music. <laughs> And I was very, uh, oh, why? If it would have come from Doldinger or from Ziggy Hoffman, I wouldn't be surprised. But with Peter Trunk, I was surprised. But, uh, however, it was, uh, yeah, in a way, funny, I mean, If I see Klaus Tolding, and nowadays we do that from time to time somewhere, uh, we are good, good, uh, friendly people yeah. to each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, it's, but that radio station was doing that was already a good sign. I mean, nowadays, when do you see this kind of music in in on TV or as this kind of The radio, the TV, especially the TV, has no interest in this. Not at all, no. And anyway, that is one other thing. In the early years, we were in the media all over, even in in Axel Springer's world, Welt. Oh, yeah. Or uh, in the Frankfurter Allgemeine, or the Frankfurter Rundschau, or wherever. We we were there. We were present there, yeah. and nowadays it's it's all gone. Yeah, and it's uh, that's that's a pity in a way. But uh, you, I don't know. I won't change that anymore. I would say, 
the other point is uh, the audience is there. That that is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and whenever people say there is no audience for this kind of music, this is for sure not true. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely not. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, uh, especially, um, I don't know, over the last year, uh, I mean, uh, many of it, I think, uh, like the free and avant-garde scene, I mean, took a took a big hit, I think, the last year, and uh, um, I don't know, yeah, I mean, the last year, uh, how, how did you experience it? Um, you probably were mostly in, in Wuppertal, I guess, and... Uh, I mean... Uh... Yeah, the last two years since Corona times, it was a very, very, very strange time. Yeah. Uh, a very. I haven't been on at one place for so long in my whole life. Wow! Oh, yeah. Two yeah. years in Wuppertal. Ah, oh, this is. <laughs> I mean, lucky uh, my situation is, I, I'm a little bit lucky because I was busy with making one or the other exhibition. I was busy in my studio with my painting work and so on. Uh, so I was busy, but I'm missing this, uh, the traveling, the audience, We had a couple of weeks ago, we had a three days uh, music event here in one of nice cafes and we had a good international audience and it was so nice to see uh, the audience again. Yeah. And it came from Scandinavia, from Poland, from everywhere. So that was nice and I miss that. Yeah. For my very personal situation was in these two years, uh, my lung problems okay. increased quite a bit. Okay. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm working on that, being back on the road uh, at least next year again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think many would uh, love to see you more and more on stage that's I, uh, a couple of years <laughs> i would like to do yeah i, I still have things in mind yeah, I think. yeah 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 um and so to uh, yeah maybe a little to to come to the end uh, maybe some practical musical questions or more practical questions um do you have a like preferred um combo group size or do you think that there is one for you where you can express yourself the best or the most? Naya, from the very beginning of my little career it was always a trio with bass and drums yeah. and if you, if you look through all the decades you always will find this kind of yeah. uh, situation. Uh, but on the other hand, I like the, the duo or another point not to forget. I mean, being on the road, you do it anymore with a quintet or a sextet because uh, it's a question of money. Yeah. The money is not there for a bigger group. I have tried that with the Chicago quintet. Yeah. Uh, for more than 10 years. And uh, if you do that and everybody is playing more or less for peanuts yeah. over this long period and nothing is changing to the better, then you give up sometimes. It's yeah. and, and so being on the road means you travel with a duo, trio, something like that. That's a very economic uh, thing to yeah. do. And uh, that is one side, not to forget. But the other side, for me as a trio, 
or a quote, but then I had to find the right partner. And I found with Kondo Toshinori, I found really uh, the best I could could have found. And and, and how they, and what how um, and what what do you uh, or for what do you look in or what what appeals to you to um, to trumpeters like uh, Kondo or uh, like in general your musicians you played with? I don't know. I'm I more feeling. I'm or? glad if if the guys uh, surprise me, yeah. but of course I. I didn't know from the early Japanese years. I didn't know Kondo, and I know he is trumpet players. You don't find very mm. often, but he could play the horn. And even when he started to use electronics with it, he was able to use them very sensitive and very in a very personal way. And uh, with Kondo, I mean, we could. We could sit a whole night long in a bar and talk and talk, not not about music, yeah. no, about everything. And uh, he was uh, my brother in a way. Yeah. And, yeah. and I was really lucky to have him. And uh, now since four, six years now, I work with this Lady from Texas, yeah. Heather Lee, yeah. and she is a very, very good uh, partner for me. And recently, I found a very young lady. Her name is Camille Emai. Okay, she's she is from the south of France, but living in in Basel from time to time. And I heard her first. She's a drummer, percussionist, whatever you will call it. And she is a beautiful, strong, strong woman. Yeah. And uh, so I'm, I'm lucky to find these guys. And of course, I'm lucky to have uh, people like Anne Benning yeah. or Alex Schlippenbach or Hami Drake. Or William Parker, uh, yeah, yeah. That is, uh, I can't ask for for more. <laughs> no, certainly, certainly not. Yeah, I mean, those are just incredible musicians. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, and I mean, I just mentioned uh, these four or five names, yeah. but uh, <laughs> there's or uh, the Full Blast trio with. With Michael Bertmüller and Marino Pliakas. Yeah. I mean, that are. Sometimes we don't see each other for a year or so. But when we start again, when we begin again, it's always, always something is there. Yeah. And that. Uh, and as I said, on the other hand, I like to find uh, new people, young people. Yeah, yeah. Which is a bit difficult sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing that would interest me is, uh, I mean, I could imagine that. I mean, every musician probably knows it, but I think, or probably, you also had sessions where the feeling wasn't right, or where you felt like, oh, something's, something's just not right. And do you have like any thoughts on how to overcome this, or what did you do uh, to overcome this, or? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you if you are in in a bad situation, what helps is work. You yeah. have to work. You have to work on on yourself, and uh, the best is going on the road and try. And if it's going badly, then okay, try something else. But. Yeah. Uh, Uh, sitting at home and complaining yeah. is is not the right thing to do. I mean, it's I know it's easy said. Of course, for the for the young guys, it's not so easy to find work, and there are not many clubs anymore. 
the international connections are not working right. There's nothing happening in in Holland. It's difficult to get into the French scene. Uh, the British is there, but mostly very badly paid, and so on. It it's difficult. Yeah. And you have at the moment, or since years, since such a lot of young people coming out of the music schools, and they have learned all the same. Yeah. Uh, there are so many musicians, and they all want a little piece of the cake, and the cake is not getting bigger. Yeah. So uh, for everybody, uh, just left over some crumbs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think especially we we elaborated in this interview that probably the cake is even getting smaller. So uh, yeah, um, <laughs> might be right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, maybe as our last question, um, what uh, what are you up to in the next uh, year or two years? What do you have any anything in the pipeline? Any new projects? Uh, any release dates? <laughs> no, I. I I'm not planning. Okay. I I have my my people and I have their phone numbers and uh, what I for sure will do will go ahead with a duo with Cecily. Lee. Yeah. Maybe sometimes some guests. And I would like to work on the collaboration with this other young French woman the percussionist, yeah. and uh, I for sure will go on with Sammy Drake or William Parker, uh, hopefully with Alex and Han, if possible. I mean, we all are getting old. Yeah. You, I mean, we all have our little little things to, oh, the body is not working, or yeah. all that is happening, but... Uh, I think uh, if it comes to playing, the old guys are still there. And uh, yeah, and then maybe I see some young guys somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But yeah. I don't plan, plan things. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's it, I would say. Mr. Brotzmann, thank you very much. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.